Mahalo Nui Loa for joining us today for our conversation on conservation webinar series. We have many guests on the call who are part of Palmyra's conservation legacy, uh, the family who sold Palmyra to TNC 20 years ago, to donors who have since invested in the infrastructure and the science. We're really, really glad you joined us. It's my great pleasure today to introduce you to two folks from TNC Hawaii's Palmyra program who are here to talk about the potential of Palmyra Atoll. Chad Wiggins is the director of the Palmyra program. Chad oversees the strategic planning for the Palmyra program and is responsible for ensuring that the Climate Adaptation and Resilience Lab, or CARL as we call it, leverages conservation action globally for tropical rainforest and coral reef ecosystems. Chad recently served as TNC's Hawaii Island Marine Program Director, where he managed public-private partnerships focused on sharing and leveraging resources for regional conservation action at the scale of ecosystem impacts. Dr. Alex Wegman is Director for the, of Science for the Palmyra Program. Alex develops and implements the Palmyra Program's conservation science strategy, working closely with Palmyra Program team members, other conservancy staff and key partners. Alex served as Palmyra program director from 2016 into 2019 and before joining TNC as Island Conservation's US Pacific Islands and Micronesia program manager. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chad Wiggins. Chad. Thank you, Laurie and aloha kako. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, in this historic time uh, in which we find ourselves. I'd like to really start uh, with a message of, of hope uh, from Hawaii and from Palmyra. I think hope is important now uh, as much as any time uh, in my lifetime. And Palmyra is a place that always does inspire me uh, and make me uh, see what the potential is for the conservation work that we do. Uh, this is a really hopeful image of Dr. Sylvia Earle, an uh, important uh, powerhouse for ocean science and conservation uh, advocate and also former head of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration on a dive at Palmyra in 2014. Uh, and we can see just in the abundance of fish uh, in, in this image how healthy Palmyra is. And I'd like to pose a question for all of us to consider. If an intact island ecosystem in the middle of the Pacific recovers from climate impacts that are devastating to other islands and no one is there to study it, does it make a sound? Of course not. Um, and so one of the things that I'd like to do today is give voice to Palmyra, a special place on the planet Earth, a hope spot for humanity and for ecosystems, and I'm honored to be able to do that today. Uh, so before I move forward, if anybody's having any trouble um, hearing me, just, just let me know. Uh, but I'd like to share uh, briefly the mission of the Nature Conservancy uh, and a quick story. Uh, the photographer for this image is on the call today, I think. And um, one of the most important things uh, that Nature Conservancy works toward is working for nature and the people who depend on nature, uh, really working for everyone. Uh, and many of us have had the experience of being inspired by, by nature. But uh, one of the things we learn is that resilient areas and remote areas are uh, very uh, well equipped to deal with, with natural stressors. And so the question is, if, if a remote area can deal with natural stressors, why, why be there? Um, I would contend that we can help uh, even remote areas like Palmyra. This image is a red foot booby chick that fell uh, from her nest and ended up in some precariously perched just above the rising tidal waters um, as a small group of, of Palmyra supporters arrived at a refuge island. Um, a highly protected island in, in the National Wildlife Refuge at Palmyra. Uh, without help, this chick would certainly have been eaten by the sharks, and some would say, well, that's an ecosystem functioning, and, and they'd be right. But in this case, we were there. We were able to intervene. The National Wildlife Refuge manager, Stefan Kropodlowski, found a uh, 
a realistic looking nest for this bird and returned it. And when we came back an hour later, there was an adult redfoot booby with the chick in the nest, um, a testament to the fact that not only um, have we been in the right place at the right time, but our intervention was successful because we know that adult boobies will, will not tolerate the presence of another booby that's not their own in their nest. So a really small example of how our presence is important, but on a larger scale, just by being at Palmyra, we prevent some of the devastating impacts that in, are occurring in other coral reef and eye systems from occurring. Um, and our presence is important and, and we really need to work hard to maintain it. Uh, so just where is and what is Palmyra Atoll? Um, if you're like me, you may have Googled Palmyra at some point in your life and either saw a swashbuckling or harrowing tail or ended up in Syria. So if I could, I'd like to ask everybody just to take a moment, indulge me as long as you're not uh, driving, if you're in a safe place. If y'all could just close your eyes for a minute and picture a globe. Um, rotate that globe until Alaska and Washington and Oregon and California and Ba and America are on the right hand side and uh, Asia, China, uh, Japan, uh, Indonesia, Australia are on the left hand side. Antarctica is down in the bottom and you see that big blue expanse of ocean, the huge Pacific Ocean. Uh, and if you will now take your finger in your mind's eye and point it right in the middle of that expanse of Pacific Ocean, uh, your finger is close to the location of Palmyra. So we don't need a map to see where Palmyra is. Uh, we can imagine how remote it is and how far removed um, Palmyra is from the rest of the world. Even though it's remote, it's really important. And I wanted to share a timeline of the Conservancy's involvement. There are uh, folks who are tuning in who predate uh, the Conservancy's involvement, and that's fantastic. There's a rich history of Palmyra, uh, but this year we celebrate 20 years of uh, the Nature Conservancy um, taking care of, of and learning from Palmyra. Uh, in 2000, the initial purchase was made um, from the Fuller Leo family, and thank you for joining us. Um, and what we can see here is how the Conservancy's protection strategy unfolded from that time. So from a relatively small land area uh, with the establishment of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service managed Palmyra Atoll National Wildlife Refuge, a uh, much larger area, uh, 16,000 acres of coral reef uh, were protected. If you're wondering how much 16,000 acres of coral reef is, it's approximately half of Hawaii Island's reef. So the big island of Hawaii, if you looked at half of our reef, let's say West Hawaii, if all of that was protected, that would be about 16,000 acres. Um, really an impressive uh, ecosystem above and below the ocean. And then again in 2009, uh, the monument was expanded at Palmyra. Uh, protecting 13 million acres of ocean. What does that mean? Well, Hawaii has about uh, 2 million acres of 2.1 million acres of state waters. Uh, 13 million acres is approximately the size of, of West Virginia. So a blip when you look at the Pacific Ocean, but a really significant protected area in terms of its sheer size. And because the ocean is protected out to 50 miles, uh, the coral reefs are protected, the land is protected. Uh, Palmyra really is one of the most protected places on the planet. Um, and it also represents an area that's a meaningful scale uh, to study. In 2019, the Climate Adaptation and Resilience Laboratory at Palmyra was established. And I'm very happy that Dr. Alex Wegman is going to share more about uh, what that means for us moving forward. But if we're wondering why uh, the Conservancy was interested in and took the, the step of Purchasing Palmyra, uh, for those who haven't been there, it's an, just such an incredible place from the air to the land to the ocean and beneath the waves, uh, life proliferates at all scales. Um, and this is an example of some of the significant life of Palmyra. It's the second largest colony of uh, red-footed boobies, which you can see there, uh, both nesting and preparing to, to nest um, and soaring in the sky. 
Uh, it has at least nine species of land crabs, which are very difficult to find in areas uh, with a lot of people. Uh, they're fairly susceptible uh, to the things that we do uh, as people, but uh, you can see the coconut crab here uh, displaying the, the bright orange color pattern, which is one of my favorites. And below the waves, at least 125 uh, species of coral. Uh, for comparison, Hawaii has about 50 species of coral. Um, and then something really notable, even though there are a lot of fish species at Palmyra, their behavior is amazing. Um, it's not a while snorkeling to look back and see that you are being checked out by, in this case, a, a bohar snapper, um, one of my favorite fish at Palmyra. But predators rule the reef. Um, so sharks are ever, ever present. And because of this, uh, Palmyra represents a globally significant ecological baseline. And we, it's so important for us to study it to understand what healthy ecosystems should look like. It's more important now than ever. Um, the threats are all too real. We know that oceans are warming. Um, the ocean is absorbing uh, more than its fair share of both carbon dioxide and, uh, and the heat that we're putting out into the atmosphere. Uh, sea level is rising in part as a result of thermal expansion and also the melting of, of uh, polar ice caps um, and glaciers. Uh, the ocean is acidifying, so it's becoming more and more difficult for coral to grow and accrete its calcium carbonate skeleton and for the tiny building blocks of life, um, the small species of plankton to grow. Uh, not to mention the, the local impacts of the ecosystem, and yet uh, Palmyra's coral reef, as you can see in this image, uh, is strong and resilient and standing up to the full force of the Pacific Ocean um, and continues to, to grow uh, at a rate that sea level rise cannot outcompete. Out Why is that? I would purport uh, that as a mnemonic device, uh, healthy ecosystems are, are rad. Uh, this is a great image because you can see the corals trying to grow out of the water, um, not quite making it. But what does rad stand for? Um, quick primer on ecological theory, uh, resilient, adaptive, and diverse. And I want to just talk briefly about each of those. So what is resilience? Um, it's really the capacity to recover from impacts. Um, if we can have a system that gets heavily impacted and then returns to a, an equilibrium state, similar to what it was in before the impact occurred, that's thought to be a resilient system. Some systems can improve even beyond their initial state, uh, but it's much more common in uh, inhabited places to see systems that, that decline after impacts. So resilience is really critical to having a healthy ecosystem. Um, from the tiniest coral polyp to the largest apex predator, um, every part of that system has a role in maintaining its resilience. Researchers have been studying Palmyra's coral reef uh, since the early 2000s, and what they've found is that this resilient ecosystem has fared very well compared to other systems in the Pacific when it comes to thermal stress that causes corals to bleach and die. What we can see here is a five-year uh, timestamp of surveys of the same reef using the same video technology. And from this, we can see the corals uh, go from healthy to almost fully bleached uh, back to healthy again. And it happens very quickly. Um, and so Palmyra's corals not only recover from stress, but they actually, many of them don't even die um, when the, the bleaching occurs. That's a really important aspect of resilience. Uh, adaptive is the second piece of a healthy ecosystem that we should talk about. Uh, in truth, uh, species are shaped by their ecosystem and their habitat and their home, and their habitat and home is shaped by the species themselves. So adaptation is really a two-way street from the macro scale to um, down to the, the micro scale. And what does adaptation look like? Well, it looks like being well suited to the environment in which a species lives. Um, in very, very few, maybe no species are able to survive in a vacuum. Um, 
you know, everything it depends upon some sort of a, a chain. And so part of adaptation is fitting within the niches in that ecosystem. And here we have an example of a beautiful manta ray above a healthy coral reef. Um, and just offshore of this area, uh, we have a healthy population of sharks. And so how are these species connected and adapted to, um, to live together uh, and to, to increase resilience of the system? Well, uh, the sharks drive up small schooling fishes and the fishes are preyed upon by seabirds. Um, Alex will go into a little more detail with this later. But every species fills an important niche. The seabirds feed on the small fish. Uh, they go to the bathroom in near shore waters. Their grow uh, fuels blooms of tiny plankton. And the plankton are food for schooling fish and for manta rays uh, and for coral. Uh, so the seabird and shark and manta ray connection has been well studied at Palmyra. Uh, every species fitting into its niche um, from the big, the big to the small. And finally, I wanted to just highlight diversity. Um, this is a topic that is as important for ecosystems as it is for itself. Um, and we have in Palmyra an example of a diverse ecosystem. This is a coconut crab or a robber crab. These the species can become as large as a garbage can lid across. Um, and they're not shy at nighttime. They, they come out and walk around. Uh, I heard a joke once that the color coconut crab are the same colors of all the crabs they've ever eaten. And so this one is my favorite because it's got uh, brilliant blues and oranges and whites. Um, but really an, uh, an amazing example of a diverse land crab species that only lives in the ocean for its larval stage. And then it crawls up on land and never goes back. And unlike hermit crabs, doesn't need to carry its shell around. Uh, from the land crabs to the organisms of the deep, you know, and this image is beautiful because it has a lot of diversity of coral, but it also has the bump head parrotfish. Uh, and this was a special dive. This school of fish uh, came close to the photographer and, and uh, you could see the bull male bossing the others around. Uh, really important to have the parrot fish as shapers of the coral ecosystem and the coral ecosystem as a habitat for the parrot fish to feed. Um, and sometimes it's impossible to actually see through the fish in a uh, place as diverse as Palmyra as this image demonstrates. Uh, in the background, if you squint, you can see the hammerhead sharks, but in front of them are the thousands of tiny anthias um, and small schooling neon colored fish that are uh, consistent with a diverse and healthy coral ecosystem. And I wanted to share one other diverse species with everyone. We're just starting to unlock some of the secrets of Palmyra, including a complete inventory of all of the animals that call the place home. Uh, this is an undescribed species of cockroach, new to science, that was discovered by researchers at the University of California at Santa Barbara. And an uh, exciting opportunity to think about not only the diversity of Palmyra and how it can still have species that are new to science, but also what should we call this species? So if anyone has ideas for a name of a new undescribed species of cockroach, we welcome, welcome your responses. Um, but constantly excited by the discovery and the diversity of Palmyra. And uh, I just wanted to share one other thing, which is that the Nature Conservancy has a commitment to diversity as one of our core values, and we're very serious about it. Um, in these times and every time, uh, diversity is key not only for the wildlife that uh, we work in service of, but also for our teams and for our people. And we have a long way to go, uh, but we're committed to the long haul of making sure that we embrace diversity at all levels. So as you can see, uh, Palmyra is rad. And uh, before I head over, uh, well, that's why we have established the Climate Adaptation and Resilience Laboratory at Palmyra within the Nature Conservancy's Hawaii chapter. Uh, the lab is studying Palmyra's resilience, adaptive capacity, and diversity from multiple angles, and is being led by a scientist that inspires and challenges me to rise to the occasion in this pivotal time for nature and people. In just a moment, uh, we'll hear more from 
that scientist, Dr. Alex Legman. But first, um, Lori Admiral had a quick poll for us to make sure we were listening. So turn it over to you, Lori. Thanks, Chad. Okay, I'm gonna put up a quick poll to see how closely you were all listening. So tell us what you think. What do the letters R, A, and D stand for? Give a minute, let everyone put in their vote. Okay, I think everyone that's voted is probably gonna vote last chance. All right, we're gonna end the polling. Good job, everybody. <laughs> Good job. All right, I'm going to turn it over now to Alex. Hey. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Alex Wegman, the Director of Science for the Nature Conservancy's Palmyra program. And uh, Chad, Chad's a very hard act to follow. So um, I'll, I'll do my best here. But what we're going to do with the, this next series of slides that we're going to go through is I'm going to walk us through the Climate Adaptation and Resilience Laboratory, which I will just say Carl from now on because it's a mouthful. Um, I'm gonna walk us through our primary focus there with this laboratory at Palmyra. And in the meantime, show you a bunch more of pretty pictures from Palmyra. So with, with the Climate Adaptation and Resilience Laboratory, we have three, we have three primary areas of focus or what we call strategies. And, the reason why we wanted to organize our approach in three strategies here is twofold. One, uh, our, our, our Carl Enterprise is built on top of two decades of science at Palmyra. Has been con science conducted by the Nature Conservancy and a huge suite of partner agencies and academic institutions and other nonprofit organizations. And so we felt built, building on top of that two decades of science, we really wanted to address the most challenge the biggest challenges for conservation in the world and we also wanted to tie to the nature conservancy's organizational conservation agenda and so for the rest of the slides we're going to be talking about island conservation which is one of our strategies coral reef resilience and pelagic conservation so with our island conservation strategy, we are wrapping our very ambitious conservation interventions or our big conservation management projects in as much science as we possibly can. And we're doing this to yield the best management outcomes uh, that we can as possible. And, and then to take those management outcomes and the lessons learned from them and convey them to conservation projects elsewhere. So wondering why I have a picture of a helicopter up here. Well, in 2011, the Nature Conservancy partnered with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Island Conservation to design and implement a very complex rat eradication. We, we brought down two helicopters, 40 people, and spent a month at Palmyra, and we successfully removed all 30,000 introduced rats from the atoll. We also unintentionally eradicated an introduced mosquito species, which is a very interesting story, but we'll, we'll save that one for another co conversation with you guys. So following the rat eradication, we immediately observed changes to the atoll's terrestrial ecosystem. Our, our research part partners measured a 5,000%, yes, 5,000% increase in the number of seedlings, of native tree seedlings, and, or just tree seedlings at Palmyra. Um, and the reason for this is because the rats had been eating both the seeds and the seedlings of pretty much every tree that really tried to, to get going there. And so this was, this was a phenomenal response. What you see here on this slide is what Palmyra's native rainforest looks like. This is a rainforest dominated by the beautiful Pisonia trees, a couple other species in there as well. However, that's not really what we have today. So what we have today at Palmyra is a rainforest dominated by coconut palms. And coconut palms were introduced to Palmyra well before the Nature Conservancy uh, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service took over management of the atoll. And so what we're trying to do now is following on 
the success of the rat eradication, we're implementing a very ambitious and sort of one of a kind ecosystem resilience project where we are going to be replacing nearly all of Palmyra's coconut palms with native trees that are preferred by seabirds as nesting and roosting habitat. And increasing habitat for Palmyra seabirds will be really good for the birds, of course. But we're also doing this because we hope this dramatic change will not only be good for the birds, but it will be good for the entire atoll ecosystem. Palmyra seabirds, as Chad mentioned, forage for fish and squid out in the pelagic environment or the ocean and open ocean environment surrounding the atoll. And they do that primarily during the day. Then they return to the atoll and to the islands at night to roost in the trees, to feed their chicks. And while they're doing this, they're depositing their really nutrient rich guano onto the floor, floor of the islands or onto the forest floor. Palmyra's heavy rainfall, which is close to 200 inches per year, flushes these nutrients into the nearshore environment. And these seabird-derived nutrients, primarily nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, subsidize the plankton community, which is the base of the marine food, food web or the marine food pyramid. Um, why, why do we care about, about feeding plankton or subsidizing plankton? Well, plankton, because they are the base of this food web, are, are inexplicably important to the health of the entire marine ecosystem. So more plankton means more fish that feed on plankton, like everybody's favorite, the manta ray. And it also means that by creating more plankton, we're gonna have more fish that feed on fish that feed on plankton. And so as Chad mentioned, Palmyra has one of the world's most abundant reef shark populations in the world. And this is really no surprise because it is a phenomenal intact ecosystem as it stands. And also, as Chad mentioned, corals also feed on plankton. And this, this food source can help corals survive really stressful events, like the, like the acute increase in open temperature, ocean temperature, that, that Chad described and showed us that, that time series photo, which is just so impactful to see how Palmyra's reefs responded to, to uh, climate-driven stress. So um, again, back to an infographic. Here in this, in this infographic that was created by our colleagues at Oregon State University, uh, I just think is a beautiful illustration of how of exactly what we're trying to do with, with these large scale conservation projects at Palmyra. So first we remove rats. If you look at the left side of the panel, you see an island with rats on it, few birds, and not, not really great habitat for the birds. And also the, beneficial, uh, the benefits of the seabird derived nutrients exemplified by the purple arrow are pretty minimal. You move to the right side of this graphic, rats have been removed, seabirds are back in force. There's, wonderful habitat for the seabirds. They're very happy and they are pooping all over the place. And with that, those nutrients, the nitrogen and phosphorus are being pushed out to the reef, subsidizing the plankton. With more plankton, we get more fish. We have, a, we have healthier corals and a healthier overall ecosystem. So speaking of corals, we're moving now into our second strategy, our second coral strategy, which is coral reef resilience. So with this strategy, we're taking advantage of the fact that Palmyra has one of the most intact and resilient coral reef ecosystems in the world. And here we are working with Nature Conservancy scientists and our partner scientists to understand the drivers or, or I guess the qualities of Palmyra's coral reef that confer resilience to climate stress like ocean warming. So as Chad mentioned a few minutes ago, Palmyra's coral reef ecosystem recovered entirely from an ocean warming event that crippled other reef systems around the world. Not only do we want to document this kind of recovery to inspire hope in the persistence of coral reefs in general and, and in our ability to bring them to a state where they can, they can survive brief periods of, of ocean warming, we want to understand what exactly conferred this advantage to the reefs at Palmyra so that we can transfer that knowledge outside of Palmyra. 
So to really best understand the drivers of resilience for Palmyra's reef ecosystem, we are partnering with longstanding Palmyra scientists at institutions like the University of Hawaii, University of California, Santa Barbara, Stanford University, Scripps Institution of Oceanography down in San Diego, and, we're, and many, many others. And we're doing this to design and launch a long-term coral reef health monitoring program. And with this program, again, we are building on two decades of, of scientific research at Palmyra. And with this, we, will, we are also going to employ emerging technologies to maximize the amount of information that we can gather while minimizing our disturbance to the overall ecosystem that we are, we are just so eager to protect. Okay, now moving on to our third strategy within Carl. This is what we call pelagic conservation. And again, pelagic, op these open ocean, high seas, open ocean. So with our pelagic conservation strategy, um, what we're doing is we are, we are swimming out from Palmyra's coral reef. And when we do so, Palmyra, Palmyra the atoll itself sits on the top of an under, undersea volcano. When you go a half a mile away from Palmyra, you are in several thousand feet of water. So we quickly find open ocean when we, when we swim out from Palmyra's coral reefs. And as Chad mentioned, Palmyra Atoll and Kingman Reef, which is 35 miles north of Palmyra, are within a marine national monument that excludes all resource extraction out to 50 nautical miles from shore. So with our laboratory situated in the middle of a marine national monument, we are well positioned to study the efficacy and the impact of protecting patches of open ocean like this. And two of our priority research projects within our pelagic conservation strategy aim at doing just that. So while the Marine National Monument surrounding Palmyra is closed to commercial fishing, as, all, are, you, all, as are all units of the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument, the monument's borders are heavily fished. And many of the fish species, pelagic fish species, primarily tuna, are sought by commercial fishing fleets. And many of these species are highly migratory, so they're, they're moving vast distances every day. So a protected patch of ocean will definitely confer benefits to a species like this, like the yellowfin tuna, but it will do so while they are still within the protected area. But as soon as they swim across this geopolitical line that, that we're sure is imperceptible to them, again, they become at risk of being caught. And so we are, what we're doing is we are working with the Nature Conservancy's global science team and ocean engineering firms to explore options for increasing the residence time of pelagic fish inside protected patches of ocean like the Marine National Monument surrounding Palmyra. We are also interested in knowing how the pelagic ecosystem, this open ocean ecosystem, interacts with Palmyra's atoll ecosystem, the reef, the lagoons, the islands. And what are the main points of connection between these two ecosystems? And how important are they in conferring resilience to climate impacts? So to get at this question, we are organizing an ambitious study of, it's very exciting, so we're organizing a very ambitious study that will simultaneously follow three seabird species using satellite tags and satellite trackers. So we're gonna follow three seabird species, melon-headed whales, gray reef sharks, yellowfin tuna, and manta rays as they move back and forth from the, the atoll ecosystem, the, the, the coral reef, the islands for the seabirds, the lagoon system even, they move, as they move out from that out into the surrounding open ocean and then back. And while we're tracking the movements of these animals, we will also be measuring key oceanographic features like sea surface temperature and current profiles to understand why these species are going where they are going. So with all of our, our CARL strategies, we have two primary objectives. We want to provide knowledge that will help the Nature Conservancy, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, our partners, that will help our ability to restore and protect Palmyra's ecosystems. But in addition to that, we really want to generate knowledge and tools that will aid the conservation of island and marine ecosystems well beyond Palmyra. An example of this, an example of how we're doing this is, is a little bit surprising and it involves mosquitoes and forest birds 
in the main, main Hawaiian Islands. So Palmyra currently endures one species of introduced mosquito. It's the Culex quinquae fasciitis, or as we'd all rather say, the southern house mosquito. This mosquito carries several diseases, uh, both avian malaria and avian pox, among the worst, that are devastating to birds. Several of Hawaii's endemic forest birds are at the brink of extinction because of disease that is transmitted by this species of mosquito. So at Palmyra, we are partnering with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Verily Life Sciences to eradicate mosquitoes from Palmyra. And we're using a cutting edge biotechnology that leverages already present bacteria inside the mosquito to confer sterility to male mosquitoes. And with this, we're going to drive Palmyra's population of mosquitoes to zero through unsuccessful mating attempts. This very simplified description of that whole project, but it's incredibly complex and exciting. And so not only will this project safeguard, safeguard Palmyra's birds by eliminating the atoll's only vector for avian malaria and avian pox, but of equal or probably even greater importance, this project is gonna provide a proof of concept for a larger initiative that is underway to suppress the same mosquito species in Hawaii to prevent the extinction of several of Hawaii's endemic forest birds. Okay, we just covered a whole lot in the past 10 to 12 minutes. <laughs> so I'm gonna relax a little bit and pass the show back over to Chad to provide our closing remarks. Thank you, Alex, very much. Um, so as we can all see, uh, Palmyra represents a beacon of hope to a world facing serious threats from local and global stressors. The threats are real and daunting. So why do I have hope? Well, I once heard a kupuna or an elder in Hawaii say that you don't heal by seeing the sickness, you heal by seeing the wellness. And to me, Palmyra represents a place of wellness and healing that inspires us to continue to do the hard work to heal and give back the place is closer to home. Palmyra teaches us that abundance in nature is strong and provokes questions. Questions like, can coral reefs long survive without an intact ecosystem, including sharks and seabirds in a changing climate? Uh, what can be done to duplicate the favorable conditions we have for reefs at Palmyra while we work on the long-term uh, important work to reduce local stressors? What role does technology play in solving the challenges ecosystems face? Palmyra is not a peopled place, but it represents one end of a spectrum, a healthy island baseline that can inform our actions here in Hawaii and beyond. And as the Conservancy works to understand how humans and nature can best thrive together, it's vitally important to know what wild nature looks like. And Palmyra stands out as a healthy ecosystem and global baseline of hope and possibility to inspire us all. A place where nature rules and a place where we can all learn from seeing wellness. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Chad, and thank you, Alex. We'll take some questions now. And we have one here we'll start with. How is TNC partnering with other organizations for research? Great question. Um, Alex, do you want to tackle that or would you like for me to say a few words? Okay, I'm seeing Alex relaxing right now. That's a perfect <laughs> screen. Uh, <laughs> so really important question. Um, our research priorities are informed by the work of other organizations and in some cases they lead. Um, Island conservation is an important partner with the Palmyra Atoll Rainforest Realignment Project. Uh, they're contributing a lot of science and um, effort to that task um, and are key to our success um, above, above water at Palmyra. Similarly, our pelagic or blue water marine protected area work has been informed by and aligns with several different nonprofits who are collaborating on a series of questions that define research priorities for open ocean protected areas. Um, a workshop to develop those priority questions was convened by Conservation International and the Nature Conservancy. And our priorities are informed by and uh, 
really a good fit for those organizations' priorities. So, so we're working with Island Conservation and Conservation International um, directly, and also with a lot of other um, organizations on, on how we implement our conservation actions. Okay, and I'll throw this to either one of you. We've had a couple of folks ask, how would the elimination of the coconut palm trees affect the coconut crabs? Um, I'll take that. Can you guys hear me now? Sorry, I had a mute, mute problem before. <laughs> but um, so yeah, the, uh, it, it shouldn't affect them at all from the long, the long period. So coconut crabs do eat coconuts, that's, that's the, their name. However, we have found through research at Palmyra that we get a greater biomass, so that's more coconut crabs in native rainforests where coconut palms are not dominant. And that is, we think, because of that, that, that nutrient benefit that comes in from seabirds. So seabirds don't nest in coconut palms, they nest in the native trees. And if they're convert, conveying that, that nutrient benefit to that island, or sorry, that, that patch of forest, there's going to be more plants there for other things to eat. Coconut crabs eat plants, they eat other, other crabs, they eat each other sometimes. So they don't need coconuts to live. They just are able to open coconuts. Here's another one for either one of you. Are the strategies employed at Palmyra, like the rat eradication program, scalable to other larger and peopled places? Um, Alex um, was um, the leader. Yeah, so you, you should take that one too. You led the rat eradication. Thank you. <laughs> yes, a great question. And uh, y yes, they are. And a number of islands where rats have been successfully eradicated or removed have had uh, small communities on them. The, the challenge right now is in the tools that are needed, that, that, that are used in successful rat eradications. Um, are challenging when you have a large population of people and pets and other other animals that could be susceptible to the rodenticides that are used to eradicate rats from large islands. So in theory, yes. In practice, it's very challenging currently to take completely eradicate rats from large large inhabited islands. We have a lot of really great questions we're not going to be able to get to. Uh, we'll take just one last one here. What do you hope for Myers legacy will be for conservation? Maria, would you mind repeating that question? I had a hard time hearing it. Sure. What do you hope Palmyra's legacy will be for conservation? That's such an important question, and I, I think um, we probably both should answer that because um, we may have different hopes. Uh, to me, Palmyra is a place where um, an island ecosystem is going to be intact, even if we, we do everything wrong and in other places. Um, I hope that we can solve the problems that uh, people places are facing. But Palmyra is that aspirational place that's going to give us the strength and, and the data and knowledge that we need to do it. Um, so I see Palmyra as a catalyst for conservation globally and a place of inspiration. Alex, uh, what do you see for Palmyra's legacy? Yeah, this, that's a phenomenal question. I think um, it, similar to you, Chad, Palmyra suffered, the, the Palmyra Atoll ecosystem suffered you know, greatly during the short period of time when it was it was annexed as a US, uh, US military base during World War II. And then the US military government was there for a short period of time when they left and Atoll went back into private ownership and management. The family that was taking care of Palmyra did the best thing possible. They left it alone for the most part. And what Palmyra shows us is what Chad said, is that Palmyra shows us that nature is resilient. We just need to make sure we're doing the right things and we're allowing natural processes to unfold as they should. And when they do, you get the result as a place like Palmyra with, with ecosystems that are flourishing, that are interconnected in the ways that they're supposed to be interconnected, and they're resilient. And as we have seen at Palmyra, climate stresses that are devastating to other marine ecosystems, Palmyra takes a hit, but it gets right back up and it keeps going.
And so I think Palmyra will be recognized as, as Chad said, it's a hope spot. It's, it's a place to inspire us for greater conservation impact globally. And now with, with the two decades of scientific investigation at Palmyra and now with our laboratory there, it's also going to be a center for conservation science exploring the most important questions about how can we best protect our planet and especially these, these marine ecosystems. Uh, thank you, Alex. And I just wanted to add, if I may, Lori, before we end, um, there have been a lot of great questions uh, that I'm seeing come in, and uh, I want to honor all of all of this curiosity and, and inspiration um, by saying that I'd like to follow up uh, with as many of them as, as we can after this webinar. So um, uh, that's an aspirational goal that I'd like to, to meet to answer all of these good questions. So thank you all for contributing them. Thank you, Chad. Absolutely. Alex and Chad will follow up with those of you who asked really great questions. I'm sorry we can't get to all of them today. And Alex and Chad, thank you both so much. And thank all of you who joined us for this conversation on conservation with Alex and Chad. We couldn't do any of the work we do here in Hawaii or in Palmyra without your support. And if you'd like to be a part of Palmyra's future by supporting our work there, please let us know. Respond to one of our emails when we send you the recording of the webinar or when Chad or Alex respond to you and your questions, please let them know. So have a wonderful evening or afternoon, everyone, and aloha.